Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chief Judge George Ortiz of the 19th Judicial Circuit in Lake County, Illinois. Welcome to your courthouse at work, where judges tell the story of how justice is administered in our county. In legal updates, Judge O'Malley will be taking you to an exhibition about the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is a document which is over 800 years old, but still has relevance in today's legal system. And Judge Shippers will be talking to Lake County's own appellate justice, Mary Shostak, and also with Judge Elizabeth Rochford about judges' involvement in a reading program for school children that is just one of the many community projects that Lake County's judges are working on. In the third branch, Judge Margaret Mullen will be talking about the rule of law in our country and the role of the judiciary. And finally, because change is the only constant at the courthouse, Judge Mike Foose will be updating you on changes in the judiciary. Stay tuned. Hello folks and welcome to another edition of Legal Updates. I am Judge Tom Schipper. And I'm Judge Veronica O'Malley. Well, we are going to start today's episode by talking about a very important document in our country, the Magna Carta. This year, the Magna Carta, an historic English document which really forms the foundation of many of our civil liberties, is celebrating its 800th birthday. Judge O'Malley, you were fortunate enough to t attend an exhibit on this very important document. Yes, Judge Shippers. Recently, I was able to travel with our film crew down to Chicago and actually visit the Magna Carta Traveling Educational Exhibit. Well, let's go to that clip right now. Hello, I'm Judge Veronica O'Malley, reporting from the annual American Bar Association Convention at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Chicago. I'm here with Ms. Elizabeth Medallia, who's agreed to give us a tour of the Magna Carta exhibit. Hi. Ms. Medallia, can you tell us your position with the American Bar Association? Well, I'm a lawyer, um, but I'm the chair of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Law Library of Congress. And our mission is to support the Law Library of Congress, which is a division of the Library of Congress, the nation's, so the Law Library of Congress is in effect the nation's law library. So what is the Magna Carta and when was it written? Magna Carta uh, was a charter that was sealed. King John didn't sign it, they didn't sign then, he put his seal on it um, in June 15, 1215. It was effectively a settlement between the barons of King John and King John himself. King John was the king of England and he'd been taxing the barons uh, for his wars in France, which he had been losing. And so the barons were tired of all of this taxation, so they came up with the Articles of the Barons. They then took London and forced King John to meet them halfway between London and the King's Castle at Windsor, which was Runnymede. So they met at Runnymede. The barons presented him with the Articles of the Barons, and they came to the settlement agreement, which is now known as Magna Carta. What do you like best about the exhibit? I like the fact that it accomplishes our goal of helping people to know more about Magna Carta and its importance and its enduring legacy, which is the name of the exhibit, and also that it helps people to know and understand the law library and its amazing resources. What are some of the principles from the Magna Carta that impact people's lives today? The principles that are in Magna Carta back to 1215 that still exist today are principles that are very important to the rule of law and to the English and American constitutional systems. They include due process of law, habeas corpus where somebody who feels that they've been, um, their liberty has been taken without cause can go to the court and ask to be released, trial by jury, speedy trial, um, those are some of the principles that Magna Carta had that remain very, very important to the rule of law today. 
So I've heard that the Magna Carta is more important to Americans than it is to people in England. Why is that? The reason it's so important here is because when the English colonists came to the United States, to America, they wanted to be sure that they had the rights of Englishmen. So they, the charters that they came by, the English-speaking colonists, um, protected, gave them the protections that they translated back to Magna Carta, to the original Magna Carta. At the, so that those rights were very important as the colonies were developing. At the same time in England, uh, they were going through other situations in the English history, and so they didn't quite develop the bond with Magna Carta that these colonists who were all the way over here in America had. And then, when things started happening with the English king, and for example, in 1867, I'm sorry, 1765, when the Stamp Act was passed, um, the English colonists were very upset because the Stamp Act uh, required them to pay taxes without representation, which was protected in Magna Carta. That was another one of the principles from Magna, the original Magna Carta. And also because any objection to paying one of the Stamp Act taxes would be heard in an admiralty court where there wasn't a jury, so it violated the right to trial by jury. So they were very aware of Magna Carta, um, and it, that continued through the time of the Constitution, through the Revolution and the time of the Constitution. The protections in the Bill of Rights that was added to the Constitution very shortly after it was passed, uh, many of those derived from Magna Carta. Thank you for the overview of this wonderful exhibit. My pleasure. Thank I'm you. Judge Veronica O'Malley, reporting from the Magna Carta exhibit in Chicago. You know, I think many of us didn't quite realize how important this document was in forming many of the fundamental rights that we as citizens of the United States enjoy. Those rights that are embodied in our Bill of Rights. Thank you very much for that, Judge O'Malley. Well, our next topic is on literacy and the efforts that are being made by Lake County judges to promote literacy in our area schools. Well, that's right, Your Honor. You know, over the years, judges here in Lake County have devoted countless hours in area schools, passing along the message that reading and writing are core skills required of all students. Recently, our own Justice Mary Shostak, who is a former judge right here in Lake County and now a judge on the Second District Appellate Court, started this wonderful program entitled One Book, One Judge, One Goal, the purpose of which is to promote literacy in primary schools. And we were fortunate enough to catch up with Justice Mary Shastic and Judge Elizabeth Rochford, who is a judge right here in Lake County who has been instrumental in spearheading this program around the state of Illinois. Let's cut to that interview right now. Okay, we are here with Justice Mary Shastic and with Judge Elizabeth Rochford. Welcome, folks, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, you know, we'd like to talk about this wonderful program that we know has been going on around the mm -hmm. state. And Justice Shastic, you were... Uh, when you were president of the Illinois Judges Association, you started this program. Could you tell us a little bit about your idea of why you started the program? Well, in 2013, I became the president of the Illinois Judges Association, which is a statewide organization for all judges in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they asked me, do you have a pet project that you want to implement during your presidency? And I knew that I it, very near and dear to my heart is literacy, and I knew that there is a huge problem in our country and in our state. And I thought, sure, how about a literacy program? So I developed a program whereby judges would reach out to the schools in their areas and either tutor or assist the teachers in the classroom with literacy. And also, in, a, in addition to helping with literacy, they're a role model. Most children never see a judge unless they come to court or they may never see a judge in their life. So I thought, well, this would be a great way. So the judges donned their robes, took their gavels, and went into the classrooms That's to great. assist. And is there a, uh, a certain book that the judges bring with them when they go to the, uh, to the classrooms? That's a great question. In addition to the literacy program where the judges go 
into the classrooms and assist. In the month of February, I started a program um, whereby the judges would go into the classroom and read the children a book. It's called Abe Lincoln's Hat. And it talks about the greatest president ever and mm -hmm. our president. Our Illinois president. Our own right? president, yeah. President Lincoln. And they read to the students about Abe Lincoln's hat. And this book is fantastic. It has a lot of anecdotes about President Lincoln. I love the book because I read it to my children who are now all grown. And the children are amazing, the, the facts that they know about Lincoln, and they're really excited about the facts that they learn. So we bring these books into the classroom, and thanks to the Illinois Judges Foundation, which is the charitable arm um, of the, Lake, uh, the Illinois Judges Association, thanks to them, they give us the money to purchase these books. So this past year, we have distributed 1,500 books to children oh. in the state. Um, after reading the book Abe Lincoln's Hat, and, and we so, do it again during the month of February. Great, and, and so so the judges will come in, read the book, and then they'll be able to give the book to the teacher for use in the school, or give the book to each student in the classroom. Oh, great! Each student gets a book. So recently, I read to a classroom in Libertyville, and each child took a book home. Wow, great. Okay, thank you. And uh, Judge Rochford, as the president of the Illinois Judges Foundation, very impressive, I might say, <laughs> uh, you have been instrumental in spearheading this program across the state. Um, could you tell us how, uh, how, that, how successful it's been throughout the state of Illinois? Well, we were so excited about this initiative from the very beginning. And so when Justice Shostak brought us the idea, we, uh, in the first year, committed uh, to purchase 900 books. Um, those, we weren't certain what the response was going to be. The books were um, exhausted almost immediately. Uh, more than 100 judges uh, volunteered in the very first year. The second year, 1,200 books were provided by the Illinois Judges Foundation. And this year, as Justice Shostak said, 1,500 books. So in total, 3,600 books have um, currently been distributed to school libraries, school classrooms, and to individual students all over the state of Illinois. From the southern tip way down south all the way up here to Lake County. That's true. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I've been involved in it in Lake County, and I know personally that many of our judges here in Lake County have been participating in it. Can you tell us how uh, successful the program has been locally and the kind of reaction you get from teachers and students to the program? Well, I'm proud to say that it's been an unqualified success in Lake County. In fact, the response here has been greater than anywhere else in the state, and has, they've been true leaders in, um, in, uh, in a model for the program all over the state. More than 30 judges in Lake County have been in classrooms, and many of those judges have been into multiple classrooms. Um, we in Lake County have distributed more than 800 books. And the, the fun has been in receiving the responses from the judges. We always receive the same call. Judges say, that was the most fun I've ever had. And then they say, we're going to need more books. More fun than even being on the bench. <laughs> it's more true. fun. And, and true. you know, the success of the Lake County um, arm of the program is due to Judge Rochford, who really, you know, came in, helped us out, helped the Illinois mm -hmm. Judges Association out in Lake County. And actually, the Lake County judges received an award from the United Way um, concerning their participation with literacy in the, in the county. You came up with a great <laughs> idea and she made it work. She makes it work. <laughs> Wonderful, nice team. Yes, thank you. I, I'd like to just say one more thing that um, the response from the judges has been fantastic, but you inquired about the response from the principals and the teachers and that has also been outstanding. But I think the greatest treasure for us has been the response from the students themselves. The notes they have written, the calls we've received about um, what it was like to have a judge in their courtroom reading to them. And I think that's been the most satisfying uh, piece of this entire project. Great. Now, if a teacher wants to participate, who does the teacher contact? The teacher can contact the Illinois Judges Association. Kathy Hosty is our executive director, and I think we're going to be able to prov provide her contact information. Um, yes, hopefully it will be up on the screen. Um, and we will get the books into the hands of the um, participating. We'll match that classroom with the judge, get the books into the hands of the judge, and that's all it takes. It's really one book, one judge, uh, one, one goal. goal, and it's really one hour of time that has a, um, just an enormous impact. Well, wonderful. Uh, it's always wonderful to see both of you. You and too. I know you guys are very busy. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you, uh, and thank you for all your work on this great project. Thanks thank for, for having, having us. us. You bet.
Boy, that is good stuff. Judge O'Malley, it appears as if that program has been a huge success around the state of Illinois. I am Judge Tom Shipper. And I'm Judge Veronica O'Malley, reporting on Legal Updates. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Judge Margaret Mullen. I want to talk about the role of judges in our democracy. Let's start with the United States Constitution. It's divided into articles and amendments. The first article is about Congress, the legislative branch. The second is about the president, the executive branch. The third article is about the judicial branch. And that's why the judiciary is sometimes called the third branch of government. I think the framers put Congress first and judges last for a reason. They wanted the legislative branch to have strong power, but the Constitution doesn't give any branch of government all the power. For example, Article 2, Section 2, says the president has authority to make treaties or agreements with other nations. Now that's immense power. But like a lot of powers given in the Constitution, it's shared. The president has to get the advice and consent of the Senate, and a supermajority of two-thirds in favor is required. So the president always has to consider the senators when he or she proposes an agreement with another nation. And Article 1, Section 8 says Congress has jurisdiction to regulate commerce with foreign nations. So Congress has a say in our foreign relations too. But the courts are sometimes drawn into disputes with other countries. What is our role? A United States Supreme Court case in 1964 explains how carefully courts consider this question. The United States used to buy a lot of sugar from Cuba. In fact, there were sugar companies in Cuba owned by United States businesses. Around 1960, the relationship between the countries began to break down. Cuba suddenly nationalized its sugar industry. So what was once owned by a US company was now owned by Cuba. A boatload of sugar from Cuba got caught in the middle and a US company and Cuba both claimed they were entitled to the money for the sugar. The Cuban government sued here in federal court. Cuba lost the case below, but they appealed and the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court applied what is called the Act of State Doctrine. Traditionally, courts avoid sitting in judgment on the legality of acts of a foreign country committed within their own territory. So when Cuba nationalized the sugar industry, that was an act of state by a recognized foreign sovereign in its own territory. So because of the Act of State Doctrine, the Supreme Court was not going to decide if nationalizing that boatload of sugar was legal or not. It's an old rule that courts follow based on international law. In fact, the Supreme Court cited a case from England from 1674. It's based on the idea that every sovereign state is bound to respect the independence of every other sovereign state. And the courts of one country will not sit in judgment on the acts of the government of another done within its own territory. Now the Constitution doesn't say anything about the act of state doctrine, but remember, it's only 7,591 words long. The Supreme Court believed, however, that the act of state doctrine followed logically out of our system of separation of powers. The idea that the duties of running the country are divided in our Constitution among the different branches of government. The court thought that judges shouldn't dabble in foreign affairs because the other two branches of government are better equipped. They have tools at their disposal that we judges don't have, like diplomatic talks and economic sanctions. And showing how the three branches of government work together after the Supreme Court ruled Congress passed a law allowing courts to go ahead and act in these matters unless the president requests the act of state doctrine to apply. And that law applied retroactively 
So Cuba never did get the money for the sugar. Lately, another branch of our government has changed our relationship with Cuba again. But if an issue does come up again with a foreign government, the third branch still acts with great caution in the area of foreign affairs because we have such respect for our federal system and for the limitations of our role within it. There's a little bit about the third branch. Until next time, I'm Judge Margaret Mullen. Hi, I'm Judge Mike Foose, a judge of the 19th Judicial Circuit here in Waukegan, Lake County, Illinois. Just as the law itself is a living thing, constantly evolving to adapt to new circumstances and change, the Lake County Courthouse is always changing as well. And 2016 has brought some major changes to the 19th Judicial Circuit. Three of our longest serving judges, Chief Judge John Phillips, Circuit Judge Christopher Stark, and Circuit Judge George Bridges, with a combined total of 71 years of service, retired in January this year. Chief Judge Phillips graduated from Coe College and the University of Iowa Law School. He served in the United States Air Force, and after engaging in the private practice of law, was appointed associate judge and later elected circuit judge. In his 23 years of service, he served in all divisions of the court but really led the move and the initiative to start our specialty treatment courts, our drug court, mental health court, and veterans court programs. After a distinguished career in private practice, Judge Christopher Stark was appointed to the bench in 1989. He presided over some of Lake County's most serious criminal prosecutions and civil trials, also later serving as chief judge. Judge Stark plans to continue serving the legal community as a mediator in retirement. Judge George Bridges served as judge for almost 21 years in every division after a long career in law enforcement. Before becoming a judge, he served as a Waukegan police officer. He was wounded in the line of duty, and he also served as chief of police for the city of Waukegan. Later, he became an assistant state's attorney and also served as an adjunct instructor for Columbia College of Missouri and the College of Lake County. In retirement, Judge Bridges plans to spend more time serving his church community. Two of our sitting associate judges, Judge Kristen Bishop and Judge Christopher Stride, were appointed to fill two of these openings, and Waukegan attorney Charles Smith was appointed to fill the third circuit judge spot. All three will be required to stand for election in 2018. Before becoming a judge in 2012, Judge Bishop served 17 years as an assistant state's attorney in Lake County. She prosecuted a number of high profile criminal cases and also served as chief of the juvenile and special investigations divisions, as well as being the supervising attorney for the Lake County Children's Advocacy Center. Judge Christopher Stride served in the state's attorney's office as well. Judge Stride worked as a municipal prosecutor in private practice before being appointed as an associate judge in 2005. He has served in the traffic and criminal divisions and now presides over Lake County's specialty treatment courts. Judge Charles Smith brought more than 40 years of legal experience to the bench. After serving the Lake County State's Attorney's Office, Judge Smith entered private practice representing individuals, corporations, as well as municipalities. As a lawyer, he has tried literally hundreds of both civil and criminal cases. Two new associate judges, Judge Janelle Christensen and Judge Paul Novak, have been appointed to fill the vacancies of Judges Bishop and Stride. Both are very experienced attorneys, were highly recommended by their colleagues in the Lake County Bar Association, and bring a variety of legal experience to the bench. Judge Christensen worked as an associate and then a partner in private law firms, handling a variety of civil litigation for 22 years before joining the Civil Division of the State's Attorney's Office in 2006. Judge Paul Novak has been an attorney since 1996. Judge Novak began his legal career as a staff attorney in the Office of Chief Judge in Cook County, and after serving the Lake County State's Attorney's Office, he started a private practice primarily focused on family law, juvenile abuse, and neglect cases. While Judge Phillips, Stark, and Bridges will be sorely missed by the Lake County community, 
The torch has now been passed to the next generation of Lake County judges. Please join the Lake County legal community in welcoming these outstanding new judges who will carry on our fine tradition of ensuring that everyone, regardless of age, sex, race, religion, color, or economic status, is afforded an open and fair access to the courts to resolve their disputes. True justice under the law. Thank you. I'm Judge Mike Foos. We hope you enjoyed this episode of your Courthouse at Work. Every day at the Courthouse, we try to serve the people of Lake County with integrity, with competence, and in a way that makes every citizen confident in their judicial system. I hope that what we have shown you today makes you as proud of our court system as we are. From the 19th Judicial Circuit in Waukegan, Illinois, I am Chief Judge George Ortiz, and I thank you for watching.